Thank you, Abner and Jim, for uh, creating this conference that has inspired so many others, and certainly for putting this one on, uh, which has also been uh, very wonderful. And thanks for asking me to discuss this paper. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of the uh, paper and what it attempts to accomplish. Try to put this paper in context of the literature and then make a few suggestions and offer some concluding thoughts. This is an interesting paper about an unexplored area of arbitrage. Um, the paper's so interesting, it's so rich, there are many additional avenues that can be explored. And I think the challenge of the paper is really going to be to focus um, on specific things and make sure that they um, are answered in a very complete fashion. Now, this version is improved. I got a, a version about a week ago that was 40 pages of text. The previous one was 32 pages of text. I like the previous version. This one's even better. Longer didn't make it better, and I think it still needs to be focused and tightened. I note that uh, Mike was a discussant in between the two versions that I saw, so I think that's some evidence that some form of jawboning improves a paper. At least you could, you could argue that. Or maybe it's evidence that being a discussant is a corporate social responsibility or something like that. Uh, anyway, I like this paper a lot. Um, classic arbitrage. Classic arbitrage <clears throat> is a simultaneous transaction in two separate markets without incurring risks. Now, if we move to the merger arbitrage, we've got buying and selling, typically of the target. It's not simultaneous. We're typically attempting to minimize risks, and one of the big risks is that merger transactions can be canceled or altered. Now, we've got jawboning arbitrage. Buying and selling of the target is not simultaneously uh, done. Uh, we typically are still attempting to minimize risks, but the interesting thing here is that the risk we create some of the risk because uh, ARBs hope to influence the deal terms and outcomes, but they could also reduce the probability of completion of the deal. Then we have snowbird arbitrage. <laughs> A near simultaneous transaction involving skiing and research while purposely incurring risks. Unique aspects are that listening to research and skiing is not simultaneous, except perhaps on the chairlifts, and discussions can be canceled, so should be short. So I'm well aware of my position between this audience and the slopes, and I'll try to keep this uh, moving steadily. The public view of arbitrage is not a very positive one. Our view of arbitrage in this room is much different. Arbitrage is a beautiful thing, right? So let's look at the literature a little bit. It's well established that ARBs earn positive returns. Now the question is, why do they earn these positive returns? Larker and Lees argue that ARBs are smart in the deals that they choose. Corneli and Lee, Gomez and Jim Shea and I um, have explored the fact that ARB positions can influence outcomes. Not only that, anticipation of ARBs can influence the structuring of the bid before it's even announced. In this paper, they're looking at activist ARBs who jawbone to alter deals. I have three samples, activist ARBs, passive ARBs only, um, and no ARBs. Where this fits in the literature, we have a very nice literature on hedge fund activism. We have a nice literature on risk arbitrage. And so this paper and others are trying to bridge the gap. Hedge funds taking position around M&A and actively voicing um, their opinions. Now let's back up for a second. Um, imagine a typical deal where stock price is trading at $30 and someone comes in and announces a $40 bid. We know that the price is going to rise, 39, 39.50, maybe 41. And that illustrates the situation the arbitrager is facing. 
because they're buying at, say, 39 and hoping to profit from what we would call a speculation spread, 39 to 40, or to profit from a revision return as it goes from 40 to something higher. Now, you can see this pretty simply in an equation where you're looking at the total return is a function of the final price received minus the initial price you pay as a percentage minus any holding fees. And if we introduce uh, the bid price into the equation, we see we've got these two components, the speculation spread revision returns. Um, in a paper I did 20 years ago when I was seven, we looked at cash tender offers and specifically um, looked at how the market price, it was called the market pricing of, um, of mergers. And what we found was that that spread was negative in 23% of the deals. That is, if the offered price was 40, in 23% of the deals, the market price subsequently went afterwards uh, above 40. So the first thing I'd like to see in this paper is a little bit more detail. And again, it's a long paper already, so it's going to be difficult to do this. But, but I love that extra table that was added with, with some of the detail. Who are the ARBs? Are they hedge funds? Are they individuals? What's the process by which shark repellent identifies them? How do their tactics differ from regular ARB um, activists? How successful are they in getting deal terms? And a simple paper, a simple table, I think, would really help saying these number of deals were revised these number uh, were not. There's a lot of wonderful stats in the paper in terms of abnormal returns, but a simple table like that would, would add a lot. How did the deals change? What were the components of the speculation spread and the revision returns? Now we have a nice li uh, literature on target management resistance in our field, and they typically are exploring two arguments. Management resists for their own benefit or for shareholder benefit to help improve the deal. Optimal resistance is generally thought to be a management that will bargain but not block a deal. So let's turn to this paper. Activist ARBs are really supplying external resistance to the deal. Presumably they still want to negotiate but not block the deal. But it brings up another very interesting issue, which is governance. I'd like to see more detail on governance. Do these situations represent a governance failure? Is target management really failing in its fiduciary duty to bargain for the best deal? Why do we need the activist ARBs? So more analysis of target governance structures, target management involvement in the deal, uh, target management gains to the deal. We see um, uh, very interesting evidence in there suggesting that there's a lot to be explored in terms of uh, how target management themselves might have been gaining. The choice of passive, active, or even appraisal arb arbitrage is dynamic. And so I'd like to see a little bit more in the paper about, gosh, the ARBs are falling into one of three buckets, but that could change over time. I could be a passive ARB who suddenly doesn't like the direction the situation is going, and I then become active. What would encourage me to do that? To what extent do, um, do I anticipate other ARB activity? In the new version, there's a very nice table 3B that helps. I think a little bit more could be done there. Uh, do the passives ever become active? Do the passives anticipate active arbitrage? Are the initial terms influenced by the anticipation of ARBs? Coordination. What is the role of coalitions among ARBs? Knowledge of your own actions we know is very valuable. Knowledge of what your peer activist is doing is also valuable. Um, there seems to be many cases in this sample that they have multiple activists. So is there any evidence of them coordinating and what are the different effects? The paper argues that ARBs lobby ISS. I have no doubt that they do that, but I'd like to know a little bit more about it. ISS, of course, is uh, Institutional Shareholder Services, or as some refer to it, Integrity Sold Smartly. 
So I like to know which comes first. Is it ISS? Is it the uh, market? Probably, in terms of the adjusting of the price, or is it the ARBs? There are a few strong statements in the paper that I think should be, uh, should be carefully reconsidered. Activist ARBs endeavors constitute a public good. It's not clear for me how much we're gaining from the activist ARBs. Uh, from table six, and maybe it's just my reading of it, but I didn't think it was, the evidence was overwhelming that the activists were adding more than the passive. Also, while the research design is standard, we can't know what the return would have been without the activists, so um, that's, that's just the nature of the beast. Activists are, <coughs> make deal success more likely when they are welcomed. Now, welcomed here is relating to the ex-ante probability of success. If you go back to my initial numerical example, someone bids 40, it was trading at 30. The way the price moves is, gives you an ex-ante probability of what the deal's going to do. The authors find that signal is more informative in deals targeted by activists. But again, do activists make the deal success more likely, or do they just choose deals where the signal is more informative? We're back to Cornelli and Lee and the knowledge versus uh, action argument. Uh, last two points, activist ARBs target low bid premia. Low relative to what? It's low relative to the other deals. It's not low relative to the terms of the particular target. Um, it's not an unexpected premia. So obviously you could model that in a two-stage approach. I think it's probably just handled by wording and an acknowledgement in the paper. Withdrawn deals. The authors find that uh, the target shareholders fare better with activist involvement. Uh, reminds us of Bradley Desai and Kim who found that that was because once you're in play, you're likely to still be in play. So that could be followed up. And I don't know that you mentioned the work you did on um, jawboning around acquirers, or if that is a really wonderful part of this paper that the ARBs are also going after acquirers and trying to um, cancel or improve those deals. Conclusion, nice topic, really like the basic structure. I think it passes the test of a discussant, which is, would I like to be involved with this paper? Yeah, I like this paper. Uh, it's a good paper, I think it can be even better. So thank you very much.